previous part uh, for stability and root locus analysis, uh, we have considered uh, on the basis of uh, Routh stability criterion, the system stability, unstability or marginal stability concepts. Uh, to proceed with the next aspect of uh, root locus analysis, uh, we will have uh, it is nothing but a graphical uh, representation of a control system, wherein uh, a control system represented in terms of a transfer function is expressed in terms of uh, poles and zeros of a system and these poles and zeros are represented over an S plane. So, it is a graphical representation, the way by which we can go for predicting the behavior of a system or a changeover of the behavior from stable zone to unstable zone on the basis of uh, the root locus parameters that is one of the most important concept under it that is nothing but the system gain. So, according to the gain changes, how the system stability considerations are going to change, we will see in today's lecture. So, moving ahead in this part. Uh, as I just told you that the root locus is a graphical representation which will be represented in terms of an S plane and generally when we go for referring it, uh, how it will look like, it is nothing but a symmetrical way of approach or uh, representation on a graph paper about the real axis. So, an S plane generally will have two concepts where or two axes along which we are going to plot it. So, say for example, we have got the first axis over here and second axis over here, the representation of the horizontal axis is nothing but the real axis given in terms of sigma and the vertical axis given in terms of j omega that is nothing but the imaginary axis. So, the things will be represented over a S plane in the form of the representation of the poles and zeros of a system. So, in today's part, we will see the, the rules or steps in order to draw the root locus concept. We will go uh, to the rules one by one. Rule number one is nothing but it is to locate the open loop poles and zeros in the S plane. Now, what I just told you that whenever any type of system will be given to you in terms of a transfer function, it will be represented by a numerator polynomial and a denominator polynomial. So, that is a general representation, but when we have that representation in form of the zeros and poles of a system that representation can be directly utilized in order to find out the open loop poles and zeros in the S plane. So, that will be the first part. So, the open loop poles and zeros and the way by which the poles and zeros are designated, they are nothing but given over here. So, the poles will be represented by a letter N and the zeros will be represented by letter z. We will have a one change over here, the poles represented by p and zeros will be represented by a letter z. Now, the representation means you have to just find out how many number of poles and zeros we have got in a particular system and that representation what I just told you that for a given transfer function, the representation will be in terms of the zeros and the poles in terms of the transfer function. The second rule is to find out the number of root locus branches. Now, in order to draw the branches on the S plane, the general way by which we can go for finding out how many number of root locus branches are present, that will depend upon the number of poles of a system. So, if in the given example, the number of poles is nothing but the poles given as p is say for example, value is 3, we will say that we will have 3 branches or number of root locus branches are 3 in number. Now, this consideration generally depends upon a particular way that is nothing but when the number of poles are greater than the number of zeros, in that case we can say that the number of branches is equal to number of poles. But when the zeros are greater than the number of poles, in that case the number of branches is are always equal to the number of zeros. So, most of the time this parameter that nothing but the number of poles is always greater than the number of zeros and this condition we will be taken into consideration that 
the poles greater than 0. So, every time it will be the number of poles that will be the number of root locus branches. Rule number 3, in order to identify and draw the real axis root locus branches. Now, here the part I have just told you, we will just draw it as a representation. So, this is your x axis representing the real axis. This is the y axis represented by j omega that is a imaginary axis and here we are going to plot the poles and zeros. The representation of poles uh, is given by the representation of poles over the s plane will be given by a small cross mark and the representation of the zeros will be given by a small circle. So, here we want to test whether what part of the real axis is having a root locus branch over it. So, the way by for just identifying that parameter is I will just read out the part. If odd number of open loop poles and zeros exist to the left side of the point on the real axis, then that point is on the root locus branch. Let us see what it means. Say for example, I have a pole at origin, I have got a pole at s is equal to say for example, minus 3, s is equal to 0 and I have got one pole at s is equal to minus 5. So, these are the three pole condition. So, we will naturally have three root locus branches. Now, in this part, in this rule number 3, we have to identify that what part of the real axis the root locus branch lies. So, here the rule is telling that if I just stand say for example, at point s is equal to minus 1 or between s is equal to 0 to minus 3. So, if I stand between s ranging from 0 to minus 3, if I take this band first over here, if I stand anywhere between 0 and minus 3 and if I count the number of poles, so if standing over here, so that is the testing point. At this testing point, I just find out how many number of poles and zeros are present on the right hand side of my standing or testing point. So, if this number, if this number is coming as an odd number, then I can consider that from the pole to the pole, this pole, I have to darken the portion, it indicates that there is a root locus branch lying between these two poles. I will have the second test point now. When I stand say here between s is equal to minus 3 and minus 5 somewhere and then I count the number of poles and zeros to the right, then I find that the number is an even number because it is 1 plus 1 that is 2. Therefore, between minus 3 and minus 5, there will be no root locus branch. If I stand at s after s is equal to minus 5 anywhere, up to infinity, I will observe that on the right hand side, I, have, I can take the summation as 1, 2 and 3. So, it is an odd number clearly indicating that after minus 5, I can take up to infinity that I have to darken the portion. Means, this part of the real axis is a part of a root locus branch. So, branch is coming from s is equal to minus 5 to infinity, branch is between s is equal to minus 3 and s is equal to 0. So, that is why I have darkened the portion. This rule is very important in order to define one of the most important next parameter that could be the breakaway and the break in points. So, this is very helpful in deciding that particular part. So, that is rule number 3, the testing point considerations to find out the real axis part of the root locus. Then we move to rule number 4, where you have to find out the centroid and the angle of asymptotes. Now, here the meaning of the centroid and angle of asymptote is nothing but, the centroid is nothing but a point which we have to define where the asymptotes are going to intersect. And what is meaning of asymptotes? An asymptote is nothing but a line which is showing the direction for the particular root locus to travel along with. So, this is an helping parameter. So, these angles have to be defined along which the root locus branches will go towards infinity and that angles are to be drawn at the centroid. So, we have to define these two things. One is the centroid and the next part is angle of asymptotes. So, to define the centroid that is nothing but in this case alpha that is nothing but equal to summation of real parts of the poles minus summation of real parts of the zeros divided by 
the number of poles minus number of zeros. So, with these things in our hand, we got the real part of the poles, we got the real part of the zeros and dividing with the number of poles minus the number of zeros, we can define where that point centroid is present over the S plane and we have to just locate that point at which we have to draw the angles of asymptote. So, say for example, by substituting this num poles and a zero configuration in the formula, we find that say for example, as we are getting this centroid alpha at 1 point sorry minus 1.33 somewhere. So, I have located that point and at this point, the next part is I have to find out the angle of asymptotes, I have to draw the angle of asymptotes on the S plane. So, to define that angle of asymptotes, to get that angles, that angles will be defined on the basis of this formula that is 2 q plus 1 into 180 degrees divided by the number of poles minus number of zeros. Now, here there is one limiting condition for the value of q. So, p and z are defined by the numbers where q is going to be defined on the basis of 0, 1, 2, 3 means the final value that is the limiting value which is coming over here that is p minus z minus 1. So, in an example, if I got the number of poles as 3, if I got the number of zeros as 1, then 3 minus 1 minus 1 will be the answer for the q limiting part. So, 3 minus 1 will be 2, 2 minus 1 is 1. So, limiting value of q is 1, it indicates that the value of q will range from 0, it will be the first value and second value will be 1. So, 1 now becomes a limiting value. So, you have to substitute q as 0 first, get the value of the angle of asymptote, you have to substitute value of q as equal to 1 and then get the angle of asymptotes. So, accordingly we can just define the centroid and the angle of asymptotes. Rule number 5 is telling about the intersection point of the root locus branches with an imaginary axis. Now, in this part, when we are gone to the concept of defining the location of the poles, so I have taken say for example, the poles at this point. So, this is an just illustrative purpose. I have defined S is equal to 0, S is equal to minus 3, S is equal to minus 5, I located the poles. So, this is a no zero condition. And then I am going to define where that centroid is coming, say for example, the centroid is coming at this point. So, 3 poles will be indicating that I have got 3 branches. So, that branch calculations angles of asymptotes will be something like 60 degrees, 180 degrees and 300 degrees and then I have to define the, the second rule I already have defined that this is the darkened portion between these two parts and after this pole the portion is darkened. So, 3 poles means 3 branches, first branch will start from s is equal to 0, second branch will start from s is equal to minus 3 and the third branch will start at s is equal to minus 5. Now, here when the poles will start or the root locus branches will start from individual poles, they will go towards infinity towards the infinite 0, because here there is no finite 0 which is mentioned in this example, say for instance. And therefore, we have to take this root locus branches towards infinity along the asymptote at 60 degrees, along the asymptote at 180 degrees and the third angle is say for example, at 300 degrees. So, along this three different asymptotes, I have to take the branches. So, the first branch will start from S is equal to 0. Already you have darkened this portion, it indicates that the branch has to start from 0, it has to approach towards the centroid and from the centroid first part part after which we have to consider will be the point of a uh, intersection of two poles or two branches coming together that is called as a breakaway point. So, in the next uh, rule we will define the breakaway point after which that breakaway point the root locus branches will break away and then it will cross the imaginary axis. So, one branch will go in this direction, other branch will go in this direction because the root locus branches are always symmetrical about the real axis. So, after considering the breakaway point after which the branches have broken uh, away from the real axis and they are going towards the asymptotes along the first asymptote, second asymptote and the third branch starts from the third pole and goes towards infinity at 180 degrees. Now, here this point is crucial, at what point it is going to cut the 
imaginary axis that is nothing but defined by rule number 5 that is the intersecting point of the root locus branch with the imaginary axis. So, in the concept of stability we have done this aspect of intersecting point of root locus branches to be found out in which we have defined the characteristic equation, we have defined the route table, we have defined a zero row, we have defined an auxiliary equation out of it and when we equate the auxiliary equation to zero, the roots what we get, those roots will be defined as the cutting points or the intersecting points of the branches with the imaginary axis. So, this is nothing but defined for rule number 5. Rule number 6, what I just told you regarding to find out the break away and break in points. Now, this is applicable for two considerations. If there exists a real axis root locus branch between two open loop poles, there will be a break away point. What I just told you with example, if there are two poles over here and if I have darkened this portion, one branch will start from right to left, other branch will start from right to left to right and when it comes at the this point, this is called as a breakaway point. So, this breakaway point concept is applicable for two branches with two open loop poles which are approaching towards one another and they have to break away from the real axis and move apart. But whenever we have got a zero on a real axis in that part, we can define that whenever we have got a 0 and say for example, we have got one more pole over here, the things are going to change. So, here there are 3 poles, therefore 3 branches and there is one 0. So, 3 minus 1 that is nothing but 2. So, 2 branches will go towards infinity and one branch is going to end at this 0, at this finite 0. So, this is a breakaway point you have to find out and when the poles break away, the break away consideration will be over here that they will come and this is the break in point where that break in point will come and merge at the 0 of a system. So, whenever you got a 0 on the real axis, there is a must case that there will be a break in point. Whenever you got poles on the real axis, there is a must condition that will have a break away point. And the general part for consideration is that when we have to find out the break away and break in points, these are the general steps we have to take into consideration. So, the characteristic equation what we have found out from a transfer function that you have to write first in terms of k on one side and all these terms we have to just transfer on the right hand side. Then the second step is nothing but we have to differentiate k with respect to s and make it equal to 0. So, that is the second step you have to take and the third part is that when we substitute the values of s in this equation, the values of this parameter, the values of s for which k value is positive are the break away or break in points. So, these are the three steps we have to, we have to follow in order to just define where that break away or break in point of that system exists. The next rule that is rule number 7 to find out the angle of departure and angle of arrival. This is a particular condition which is applicable only when we have got complex conjugate open loop poles and complex conjugate open loop zeros. So, the first condition suffice for angle of departure is applicable when you have got a complex conjugate poles and angle of arrival will be a part when we have to when the system has a called complex conjugate zeros of a system. So, in the last example, I told you about the real poles and zeros, but in case say for example, I got one real pole at s is equal to 0 and I got a complex conjugate over here. The meaning of complex conjugate is nothing but a root which is nothing but made up of real and imaginary part. So, real part say for example, this is minus 2 and this is 2j, this is minus 2j. So, the location of this pole, this is nothing but a complex conjugate pole which is nothing but minus 2 plus minus 2j. So, if you got the poles of this configuration that is a complex conjugate, I have to go for defining that the angle of departure for that particular case. When in a system, say for example, I got complex conjugate zeros of a system 
and I got two poles over here. So the natural tendency will be that the poles will come together, they will have a break away point and then this will come and end at this particular zeros. So here we need to have this angle of arrival. So this angle of arrival is applicable whenever we have systems with complex conjugate open loop zeros and in the first case we have seen that when the angle of uh, departure consideration is applicable only when the system has a complex conjugate open loop pools of a system. So these are the few rules what we have, we have to take into consideration in order to draw a root locus on for a particular system which is going to be defined for and in that part we will see, we will see in the next lecture to proceed with one uh, particular type of example and how we can adopt all these rules one by one, all these steps one by one in order to configure for a root locus branches. And then on that basis, we can go for defining the system stability, instability and marginal stability. Thank you.